This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 3rd, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular weekly segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly on Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we talk about SB 1002, the Senate's new PFD bill. Second, we discuss the let them eat cake attitude many Senate Republicans are taking about the PFD. And third, we discuss the latest movements in oil prices. Rather than stabilizing around $70 or even even increasing as some predicted, at least for the moment, oil is moving rapidly in the opposite direction. And now, let's join Michael. So let's kick things off. Um, the, uh, the, 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 up, the updates, the Capitol Live update from the Juno Empire. Uh, you sent it to me. I read it. Um, I went through it. I tried not to lose my mind uh, too late. I'm pretty upset about it. Give us give us your your breakdown of this because I'm just I am just offended by kind of the reaction from most of the members that are quoted in this piece, basically saying, "Oh well, we'll just give you what we can afford or what we think you can afford, and we'll take the rest, and you'll be happy with it." Yeah, it's a, it was not a good day for the Senate yesterday um, uh, to have. Uh, Giesel and and Coghill and von Imhoff uh, speaking for the for the Senate Republicans. Uh, all three uh, have 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 been PFD cutters, taxers um, since the outset, um, and all three have an attitude that is not consistent. I think with certainly what you find in in, in other segments of the state, and and having them be the lead spokespersons for. Uh, for SB uh, uh, 1002, I probably uh, sent the wrong message. But uh, but I want to back up a second on SB 102. I don't understand. I truly don't understand the strategy that that the Senate uh, or the House anymore is pursuing uh, on the PFD. They had the PFD in the budget. There was there was a three thousand dollar PFD that came from the Senate uh, in its budget. The House didn't have a PFD in there. The budget's in the conference committee. Uh, there was enough room. There's enough room in the conference committee uh, to work out uh, what the PFD is going to be among the conferees to send it back to the to the two bodies and let the two bodies uh, vote up or down on it. And the way the conferees work, uh, the conferees are trying to are trying to represent consensus in their groups. It's not just whatever the conferees want, maybe with the exception of Natasha. But but they're trying to represent uh, consensus in the group. So presumably the conference was going to come up with some sort of number that would represent the consensus in either body. This breakout of the PFD into a separate bill um, is troubling uh, uh, from from a couple of perspectives. The one the one explanation I've heard about why they're doing it is to try to try to isolate the PFD issue, let that work its own way. And go ahead and get the budget done, and get it to the governor, um, and let the budget uh, let the governor do what he's going to do to the budget, and try to get the budget finalized uh, before we hit July one, uh, and we don't have a budget, and then we confront what we're going to do as a state about that. And so it's sort of to try to get the budget back on it on a separate track and, and work it. But if I'm the governor, I'm not going to accept that. I mean, it, it, it once once the budget's done, what incentive? Is there in the legislature to move this separate bill, right? Uh, assuming it's trailing behind, to move this separate bill and to get a bill to me as governor uh, that that I can sign? I mean, the, the leverage I've got as governor is is in the context of the budget. 
I might be willing to trade off some budget items, not veto down some budget items that, that legislators want, if I'm going to be able to get a, a full PFD. But once the budget's gone through, there there isn't that there isn't that trade anymore, and the and the legislature can just come up with sort of whatever number it wants, uh, and on whatever time frame it wants to get it to the governor. So I'm not I'm I'm truly not understanding this. Uh, this process that the legislature has embarked on, I don't think it has. I don't think it has any sort of good ending to it, and I think taking it out of the budget process is frankly going to slow everything down, as opposed to, as some have said, uh, try to speed it up. Well, and and this is my this has been my problem too, Brad. Because I mean, check me if I'm wrong, but I seem to remember the governor basically saying, if the budget did not include a full PFD, look for the big red pan. And if he, they've taken it out of the budget, I think they, 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 that falls directly astray of what the governor has said he is looking for. And like you said, once the, once the budget's passed, there is no impetus for them to continue on this. Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's, it's really strange. I mean, we're, we're spending a lot of time worrying about what the Senate's doing, and the, and the House took the week off last week waiting on what the Senate was going to do, and now the Senate's coming up with this, and they're going to vote on it. Well, what happens to it after it goes to the Senate? I mean, it has to go over to the House, right? And the House can uh, the House has demonstrated they know how to take their own sweet time about things. Um, and then let's assume the House amends it and comes up with a different number than the Senate did. So then it's going to go to conference, um, and it's going to be and it's going to sit in conference. I just I'm not. And in, 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 in the meantime, we're supposed to accept that they're going to come back into the budget, take the PFD out of the budget, do the budget, and send it up to the governor. And while they're still sitting on the on the PFD bill, I'm just not seeing the strategy of it. I was, it, ironically, uh, as I was <coughs> going through opening up Facebook this morning, I had a memory flash up of of uh, a trick that Mike Chenault tried to do uh, a few years ago, four years ago, maybe three years ago, when he was speaker of of taking a bunch of money out of the uh, uh, earnings reserve and stuffing it into the permanent fund corpus, uh, not for the reason that, that we're talking about doing it now, but but to do some trick uh, that would create an opportunity where they didn't have to get a two-thirds vote to access the constitutional budget reserve. And that whole episode uh, never made sense to me as a procedure and sort of sort of felt flat on its face. I mean, it was it was like cutting off your nose to spite your face, right? We were going to take all of this money out of the earnings reserve which you and I have discussed has a lot of problems with it. Chenault was going to do that and stuff it into the permanent fund corpus in order to, you know, create a trick where they could get a CBR vote with a, with, with just a simple majority. And it just fell flat on his face. This one is strikes me in the same way. It's a procedure. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's divided the issue. Yeah. But this is an issue. The PFD and the budget need to stay joined together. Uh, it's not an issue that needs to be divided. It's not an issue that's going to be uh, advantaged uh, by being divided. And I just I, we're, we're going through this whole rigmarole for reasons that that just don't make any sense to me. Brad Keithley is our guest, uh, Alaskans uh, for a sustainable budget. We're talking about what's happening in the Senate right now. But, Brad, we're assured that don't worry. They're going to put that three thousand dollar amendment on the bill. It'll be fine. It don't, you know, nobody panic. It'll be okay. All I see right now are red flags. I mean, all I see. Well, go ahead, hey, Michael. Let's assume. Let's assume the Senate does that. Let's assume that somehow, magically, we get a three thousand dollar PFD out of the Senate, which, by the way, we've already done once before. Uh, but but let's assume we get a three thousand dollar out of uh, PFD out of the Senate. That's just the Senate. It's got to go to the House, and the House has been very clear. The House leadership has been very clear. They're not going to agree to a three thousand dollar PFD. Right. Um, and so, and so we got this bill. We got uh, you know, got all the senators ginned up. You know, senators get to take whatever stance they're going to take. They vote whatever they vote. Let's assume for a moment that they get a three thousand dollar PFD. It goes over to the House, and the House says, oh, "Let's hold some hearings on that for a while." In the meantime. <laughs> In the meantime, the budget, you know, everybody's trying to – everybody's getting concerned about the budget. Oh, my God, we got to get the budget done because, you know, we're otherwise going to have to give state employees, you know, notices. <laughs> Let's move the budget forward, and, and we'll get to this PFD thing. I, it just 
I, we're, 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 we're developing, we're spending a lot of time on a process that I just don't think is additive to the, to the end result that we're trying to get at. Well, and I think the thing that you bar- brought up at the very beginning before we came on the air in our first, uh, in our first discussion on this, uh, as you first joined us, was the one thing they seem to continually be ignoring in this is that it is the law. I mean, they're doing all this thing. They're jumping through all these hoops. They're making all these machinations. But the bottom line, the thing that they continue to be ignoring is that this is the law, and they are ignoring it. Oh, let me catch a couple of the comments here in the chat room. Chris comes in and says, I was told there would be back pay. <laughs> we can't even decide on front pay, Chris, let alone back pay. I mean, at this point, I mean, what are, what are the possibilities of even getting a full dividend, let alone repayments of these past dividends, Brad? It just seems like vanishingly small with the players that we have in there right now. Anyway, nobody seems willing to do any of this. No, I think you're right, Michael. The governor has has isn't even pressing for the uh, for the back pay on the on the previous two dividends. I think that I think that the 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 opportunity and the press is is to is to do this one's right, and maybe we address back pay in subsequent legislatures, maybe not. But but getting a full dividend at this point is uh, for this year is is the is the is the objective. And I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm concerned as I look more and more at this. I mean, we are supposed to have, um, you know, these Republicans are supposed to be, um, you know, are champions of smaller government. I mean, that's ostensibly right. I mean, that's supposed to be what's happening. But all I'm seeing is just we can't cut. We need more. We've got to spend. We can, we are going to decide how much to give you. You're going to be happy with it because we've got all these other important things that need to be funded. I mean, the fact that we funded all these things at a, at a fraction of what we used to just 10 or 15 years ago, that doesn't matter because now they're at these levels and now they need to stay there. And and I just think that is just – it's tragic. It is. And And – and, the, and, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate. I mean, I understand why, because it's money and they're trying to grab the money. But the PFD should not have gotten mixed up in this. The point I was, we were talking about before, I, before my connection got confused was, was the statutes. The statutes say there's going to be – the statutes now read there's a 5.25% draw from the permanent fund. Done. Check the block, box. The statute then says uh, from that 5.25%, you pay the statutory dividend, which is calculated on the average of the last five years of earnings. There's enough in the 5.25% to do that. So we ought to be in a process where the second box is checked said, and said, done. You know, we've, 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 we've sent that money off to the permanent fund uh, uh, dividend office to be, to be paid out in dividends, and we don't need to worry about that anymore. Now, then we, then we ought to say, now, what do we got left? Well, we got a lot of spending, and we don't have enough revenue. Right. That's what we that's what we ought to be confronting, uh, that we have a lot of spending and we don't have enough revenue remaining. And if they have if they if they really want to go after the dividend, they ought to have the guts to go to amend the dividend statute. But as long as they don't, the dividend statutes are clear. Five point two five percent from within that. You can't you take the dividend out. Statutes statutes tell you what to do. You're off. You're done. And and now you ought to be confronting what what's uh, what's what's what the remainder is. As long as they don't change the statutes, that's what the statutes say you do. Right. They they and 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 I think we would have a moment of clarity uh, in this state if we got if we did that, complied with the statutes, and said, well, we've got X revenue and we've got X spending and we've got only got Y revenue. What are we going to do? Then we should have a discussion about taxes. And frankly, I think that I. I agree with Natasha sort of on this. Once we talk about taxes, there's going to be a come to Jesus moment. And and I think it's going to result in people saying, well, wait, you know, if we're going to tax ourselves, we're going to tax all of us, including the top 20 percent at, at, at some sort of flat tax rate or progressive income tax rate or some sort of tax rate. Wait, I'm not I'm not willing as a member of the top 20 percent. I'm not willing to pay those taxes. Get spending down. <laughs> and I think I think that's where this thing gets resolved when people confront the fact that all of us are going to have to pay for this 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 excess government government that we've built up. This is mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. But this is where we're at right now. The good news is they're in the special session, so they can't change the statute because it's very limited. 
Thank God for that because now they're by, they're backed into their own corner. You guys have got to follow the statute or blatantly break the law. Brad, we need to wrap up number one. I just said, uh, which I think is is good to know, is that the one thing, because it's a special session, it's limited, they can't change statute. All they can do is discuss the amounts. So they back themselves into a corner. They either have to follow the law as it is written or blatantly violate it. And I think that's good because now you can hang this on each and every legislator when it comes time for re-election. And I think that's an important distinction at this point. Yep. They talked about changing the statute last year, the dividend statute. They couldn't get a majority to do it. They're trying to act as if they did do it. Leadership's trying to act as if they did make an amendment to the dividend statute last year, but they didn't. And so the statutes read very clearly 5.2%, 5.25% draw from the, from the permanent fund. Uh, that's, that's what you're entitled to out of the permanent fund. Out of that 5.25%, the statute says you will pay, shall pay. Uh, a, a permanent fund calculated on the basis of the average 50% of the average earnings over the last five years. You could, there's enough in the 5.25% draw to do that, uh, and you can comply with that. They need, they need to comply with those two statutes, and that, that takes the PFD off the table. Uh, the fact they don't do that, uh, the fact they're not doing that, the fact they haven't done it the last two years, makes them, there's no better word, lawbreakers. Yeah. We have legislators who are lawbreakers yep. um, uh, operating operating without regard to statutes uh, and sort of making it up as as as, go, as I go along, and that's just breaking the law. So it's uh, th- the PFT ought to be fairly easily resolved. The fact it's not the, the fact that it isn't is simply the fact that the legislature won't observe the laws that they that that they and their their predecessors have passed. Well, and I think I've heard a lot of talk about how well there's a lot of people in there who support a full PFD, but they're kind of protecting some of the others like von Imhoff and others. But the more and more I see it, it seems like everybody's kind of coming together with a kumbaya. We've got the seven who don't want to who don't who want a full PFD, who don't want to cut into it. Uh, but unfortunately, the, one of the main proponents, Mike Shower, is just is not there because they've run the clock out on him. And uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know if he's going to make it back for any of these votes. I don't know any of that. But it's I mean, it's pretty frustrating at this point. It is it, it yeah, to, but, to watch. But but to go back to the beginning, it really doesn't. In all honesty, what the Senate does doesn't make a difference because it's going to go from the Senate over to the House. And then if the House differs with it, it goes to a conference committee. I mean, it would be nice. If the if the Senate passed a three thousand dollar PFD, but even if they do, it's going to go to the House. The House is going to change it. The governor is going to veto it. We're going to be right back uh, where we are now. We need, like, as you and I talked last week, we need to get on with this. We we're just spinning our wheels in all of these made up things that they're going through trying to deal trying to deal with the PFD. Put something in the bill. Let the governor veto it. Let's get to that negotiation um, and uh, and stop. You know. Stop play acting like you're like you're actually trying to solve problems here. Right. That's our number one. We need to move on to number two in our agenda, and that is the comments that were being live tweeted by Matt Buxton from over there at the uh, Midnight Sun Alaska. He he had a he had a tweet which was basically quoting Natasha von Imhoff, and she says. Uh, uh, he says, Von Imhoff says the state can't even really afford a $1,000 dividend. Quote, we can't afford it. I don't know what we're going to do next year. We get closer and closer to an income tax, unquote. And then he says, she continues on anti-taxes. To collect an income tax and turn around and deposit it into their neighbor's pocket is not a conservative Republican value. And I made a comment earlier that, no, she has literally become the caricature of every bad movie capitalist politician like she's in the back room smoking her cigars drinking her brandy saying no we'll just put it on the backs of the little people that's fine they they're not real people anyway yeah exactly right there, there is so much wrong with that statement i mean so so the first part of the statement is we can't afford it i don't know what we're going to do next year we're getting closer and closer to an income tax we have an income tax right that's what pfd cuts are they are an income tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. I mean, what she's really saying is, oh, my God, we might have to tax the top 20 percent like we're taxing middle and lower income Alaska families. We can't do that. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's just that is the lettuce, let, let them eat cake attitude for her not even to acknowledge 
that that what we're doing to middle and lower income Alaska families is taxing them, taking diverting money out of their pockets that the statute says they are entitled to in their pockets, taking money out of their pockets, diverting it to government. That is a tax. And for her not even to acknowledge that's a tax and try to say, you know, it's not a tax until it's not a tax until it hits the top 20 percent. Then all of a sudden it becomes a tax that we have to worry about. That, that's just that's a that's a very let it be a cake attitude. But the second point I want to make is is that second quote where Matt says she continues on anti taxes to collect an income tax to turn around and deposit in their neighbor's pocket is not a conservative Republican value. So you're telling me, Natasha, you're telling me <laughs> that law breaking is a conservative Republican value because the only way you get to that statement is to say we're going to take your PFD, we're going to cut your PFD from what the statute provides. Um, and 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 give it to government. That's how we're going to avoid income taxes. We're going to take it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, put it into the pockets of government, so that the top twenty percent doesn't have to pay. Yeah. We're going to do that. That's a, that's that's a conservative Republican value. But to do that, you have to break the law. So now you're telling me that conservative Republicans are lawbreakers. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm just stunned. I'm stunned at what comes out of her mouth. Well, I mean, I'm stunned. Yeah, she doesn't even at the, at, the, at the let them eat cake attitude that's coming out of her mouth. She does not even see the hypocrisy in that statement because she says to collect an income tax uh, and, and to turn around and deposit it into their neighbor's pocket, essentially by taking these dividends. From all these people, she's essentially taxed them. Depositing it into their neighbor's pocket would be, in part, depositing it back into the government's account to redistribute that wealth the way that she sees fit. Taking it from the lowest income earners and 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 distributing it the way because they know better than us how to spend that money. They know better than the little people how to spend that money. I mean, again, the hypocrisy in this statement from top to bottom is just astounding. You know, what, what an economist would tell you, What's really going on is that middle and lower income Alaska families are engaged, are, are being forced to do a wealth tra- wealth transfer to the top 20 percent. It, it's actually the reverse of what she's trying to make it out to be. What's really happening is is the PFD cuts that are being enacted that hit middle and lower income Alaska families to fund government are saving the top 20 percent from having to also contribute to fund government. And so what you're doing is you're taking money out of the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families, and you're letting the, the top 20 percent keep their money, keep the same, the same amount of money that, or keep the amount of money they would otherwise have to contribute to government, making them wealthier, making the top 20 percent wealthier than they otherwise would be if they contributed to government, and making the, the remaining 80 percent, the middle and lower income Alaska families, worse off, poorer. Uh, than they would be if the top 20 percent was so it's, it's actually a reverse transfer it's not it's not even it's it's not even uh it's not even neutral it's the exact reverse of what she's trying to claim we're taking money out of middle and lower income alaska families and we're leaving money we're letting that letting that substitute for and letting and letting a top 20 percent alaska families keep their money yeah i mean it, it, and <sighs> I couldn't be I couldn't be more disappointed right now than than in watching this whole thing unfold, Brad. Your ones and twos have killed me this morning. Can we move on to number three because I'm sure that'll cheer me up. <laughs> well, number three is, is is oil. We flip back over to the oil side, and we talk about uh, what oil's doing. For those listeners who haven't been following, oil's back down uh, to sixty dollars. It was sixty dollars fifty cents. When I checked right before we came on uh, the air, it's been flirting at going back into the high 50s. Uh, It's come down from the 70s where it was before and and, and come back down to 60s. And and it looks like it may stay there uh, for a while. The the reason is, the reason it's done that is there's a lot of concern uh, throughout the globe in in the oil trading system, excuse me, in the oil trading system about what's going to happen to industrial demand demand generally uh as we as we go into these trade wars oil took a tumble of something like five dollars late last week when president trump started talking about enacting uh tariffs on mexico the five percent tariff on mexico that's what really jettisoned the, the the latest drop and as long as we have this uncertainty in the global economy 
about what's going to happen with the trade wars, about what's going to happen with trading relationships, what's going to happen with the economy in general. We're going to have reduced demand. Now, the Saudis said that, that they're going to continue with the production cuts that they've been on, um, uh, presumably uh, joined by the Russian, their Russian partners who have, who have been uh, engaged in production cuts. We still have the uncertainty of what's going on in Venezuela. We still have some uncertainty of what's going on in Libya. So there's still supply-side fluctuations going on, and, and the Saudis are going to try to, I think, stabilize uh, prices through control over the production side. But there's a lot of concern. I mean, you can see it by the, by the price drop that's going on, uh, on, uh, on, on globally uh, with, respect to, with respect to oil prices. There's a lot of concern built up in the system right now uh, on trade, and it doesn't look like that's, that gets resolved uh, anytime soon. Rush, the, the China trade issue is getting, is getting more complex. There's more issues being dumped in it uh, as we go. Uh, the Mexican trade dispute, I mean, Mexico is starting to push back on, on Trump's uh, 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 demands. Uh, Mexico is saying, if you guys can't stop, essentially saying, if, if you, the United States, can't stop illegal immigration, how, they expect, how the heck do you expect us to do it? Um, and, and, I, and I'm just not seeing, and, and analysts are seeing, but more importantly, analysts aren't seeing a resolution of those trade disputes uh, anytime in the near future. Well, and that spells, of course, with WTI tr- uh, trending down into the mid-50s and Brent crude pushing as low as the low 60s. That spells some pretty bad stuff for Alaska as far as our revenue projections. Um, but it also, again, this trade war continuing to spin up also could affect things, everything from seafood to, uh, of course, to our gas, you know, natural gas project and production as we move forward. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, we're, we're probably I saw Ed King had done a, did a forecast yesterday, I think, that, that says we're still on track to end up this year uh, in fiscal year with a with an oil price, an average oil price for FY 2019 uh, in the high uh, in the high 60s, 68, 69, somewhere <laughs> in that area. So FY 19 looks like it's going to be okay. But next year, but if we, yeah, next year, yeah, could... but if we go, yep, exactly. Next year is the problem. Uh, this is my concern right now: is that this the trade we keep? To, it seems like Trump keeps opening up fronts. You know, we're fighting one battle over here. He sets a fire over here where, you know, it's like we're, we're hopping back and forth. And I know that there's advocates out there that says, well, there's a method to his madness and he's doing it. But at this point, it just seems like he's it's not like a backfire. He's like setting fires all over the place and we're going to have to try and put them all out. Uh, and we're kind of being beset on each time. I'm not sure, you know, how this is going to. But I, I know here in Alaska, this is deeply affecting us. Yeah, it's affecting us. It's affecting us in a lot of industries. But, but you know, certainly from a state standpoint, from a state f- fiscal standpoint, what affects us the most out of all this right now is the is the effect on oil price. And if oil traders, I mean, if there's a method to the to the administration's madness, uh, it's not it's not, and, and there's an end game that resolves itself soon. Uh, it's not apparent to oil traders, uh, and and they have uh, substantial concerns about where we're going. So, it I I, I think. I, what this does tell you, I mean, because it was only it was only a few weeks ago that that Ed and other, Ed King and others were saying, ah, you know, seventy, maybe eighty. You know, some people are forecasting ninety, and now we're back, you know, looking at a five figure, a fifties figure uh, again. What it does tell you is you cannot rely on oil price uh, to make uh, to make any sort of advances in oil price to make any sort of of uh, fiscal plans in this state. We have to we have to continue to be we have to be very conservative about oil price, particularly now that we've run savings down, particularly now that we've run through sixteen billion dollars in savings and probably will will hit a few more uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in savings this year. Uh, we have to be very conservative of, about what we're doing. That doesn't mean, Natasha, that does not mean that you go grab the PFD. Conservative Republican values <laughs> mean you pay attention to the law. Oh. What it does mean is we need to confront. We need to confront how we're going to pay for the government we have. And once we confront that, once we start talking about taxes, my guess is the spending levels start coming down a hell of a lot more rapidly than they have in the past. Well, this actually brings me to a good, I mean, kind of a wrap up here, Brad, because we've been talking again. We've been revisiting the charter of changes, and I've talked about. 
again, changing the funding. The governor went a long way into that this year in being one of the first years where he uh, where they d- developed and, and delivered a budget where the incomes and expenditures, uh, you know, met. Um, now, maybe not in the best way with some of the taxation authority and some of the other things that were kind of pie in the sky, but um, at least he's got a start. But I think you're making a valid point. It just proves, again, that we cannot count on futures, oil pricing, predictions, a lot of those kind of things, um, which takes me back to my suggestion in some way, shape, or form of looking at past revenues, similar to what the permanent fund has done, you know, a three, five, six-year rolling average of what the revenues have actually been to inform us as to where we'll probably end up. And I think that that seems to still make more sense in planning a budget than anything else. It, it, you know, Michael, I'm, I'm increasingly coming around to that. I, I think this, I, I think having a number of years, averaging over a number of years, really sort of cushions us from the impact that any given year has on us. It sort of puts us on a trend line. Uh, it gives us uh, uh, gives us some basis for using these numbers as opposed to picking them uh, from the sky. Um, it puts more emphasis on production levels then. Frankly, if once we get prices locked in, we start focusing more on production levels, which might be a good thing, and frankly, are probably easier to predict uh, than prices. So, I, I, I think that has a lot of a lot of advantage to continue uh, to continue thinking down that track. Well, I mean, and hopefully, somebody's listening uh, that you know has got the ear of the governor. I'm looking at you, Donna. Uh, I'm hoping that somebody's listening that could say maybe we should be considering this because, again, this playing this game of guessing. And that's essentially what it is. It's a highfalutin guess, and usually it's wrong, Um, you know, has just not done us a service in this state uh, with our with our uh, with our budgets and with our pricing. And, of course, add that the lack of political will to actually make any substantive cuts. And we're you know, we're looking at uh, some real detrimental effects moving forward. You got about a minute and a half here, Brad. Well, once we once we sort of solidify oil price, and 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 we're not just wrong most of the time. We are always wrong. The oil price is always wrong. It's just a question of how wrong you are. Right. But once once we once we sort of solidify a process on oil prices, frankly, that gets us right back to what I was talking about before. We have to confront how we're going to have the additional revenue, how we're going to raise the additional revenue to pay for the government. Some people want to want to have. And once we say. Top 20 percent, you're going to pay for a proportionate share of that. There's going to be there's going to be a huge sea change, in my opinion. There's going to be a huge sea change in in the in the in the efforts to reduce spending. We're going to see people come out of the woodwork. Efforts be come out of the woodwork to reduce spending that have only been given lip service before. And I, that's where we need to go. That's the only way we're going to get spending under control when all Alaskans have to confront that they're going to have to contribute to that excess. Once they do that, then then there's finally going to be movement to uh, to get spending reduced. Oh, my God, Brad. Are you saying Hammond was right? We should have kept that income tax after all so they could know. Having, how- that, sort of, <laughs> having that sort of Damocles over your head, uh, I think, motivates, motivates a lot more than uh, – uh, than being quote conservative Republicans in Natasha's words, I mean, they're they're just they're just talking and talking and talking. We have to create incentives for them to actually do things about it. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Links at the top of the chat this morning for you to follow his Facebook page. I recommend you follow it. You like it and you follow it just like you like and follow this page. So you get notifications when he posts things and you get notifications when I go live. Same kind of thing, Brad. As always, my friend, it's good to talk with you. Thank you so much. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us this morning. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.